What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Community Voices. Today, we got a very special guest, you know, the honorable, people love him, Brooklyn's own Reverend Stephen A. Green, man. How you feeling? Wonderful, man. Thank you for this opportunity and just glad to be in conversation with you all. Thank you, Finish Line, for taking the time out to really engage in this very important conversation today. For sure, man. These conversations are super important to the community and i um, super happy to have you, you know, talk about something so important especially with the news, the good news that, um, that happened this week, so. Yeah, no, it was a, it was a rocky week, you know what I mean? Right. Up and down, the beginning of the week, not knowing, and then finally when we heard the verdict, it really put us in a place that we could finally uh, breathe, relax, you know, enjoy, but then know that the journey kind of continues after that. Exactly. Yeah, so if that's that, that's a great segue into like, you know, with a verdict in, what do we need to do as a community to continue to fight for justice and change, you know, coming off this uh, George Floyd trial? Well, sure, man. Um, the reality is that we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the community, right? In the community of young people who, were, who stood uh, and recorded the entire incident and the murder of George Floyd. And I think that's essentially what community uh, looks like beyond this, is that when you see something, say something. When you see something, record something. Yeah. Um, to be to be to be you know the scripture says to be like you know my brother's keeper right and to really look after our, our neighbor and our friends and our community and I think that's uh, a very important part of this work moving forward is that and if it were not for a video camera uh, from my dead sister then we would not have the footage that would have been used to spark uh, national protests and really global protests and so that's important but also the work in the community to uh, ensure that we are living in this idea of a beloved community, working towards building it, this radical vision that Dr. King had of community and, and, and self-empowerment, and as well as understanding that we, you know, were able to walk into the full freedoms of this democracy project in this country that we have so fought for. And so uh, being committed uh, as, com as citizens, being mm -hmm. engaged, uh, showing up at the ballot box every time there's an election, uh, as well as also running for office. I hope that this moment will spark a, a level of social change in our country uh, by people being engaged and being uh, on the front lines and not just when it's time to protest, but also now when it's time to really build power. Yeah, for sure, you gotta keep it consistent, you know? Right. You can't just do it at one time during like, you know, a, a bad moment. You gotta keep that same energy throughout the year. Keep that same energy, that's exactly what it is. Right. <laughs> So what do you believe is the most important thing for, you know, us to do or rather like the work that needs to be done? What is like the most important thing for you? Well, I think the most important thing right now is to actually implement some legislative changes. I mean, we can't legislate the heart, but we can definitely try to put uh, laws and policies in place that will prevent these uh, circumstances from happening again by ending qualified immunity. What happened to Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky was because of these no-knock warrants. Also by making a uh, lynching a federal hate crime, which it is not yet. And all of these items have been passed by the United States House of Representatives as part of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, but it's being stonewalled in the Senate. And so uh, immediately, like we have a president who's willing to sign the bill, the House has already signed it. But if we remember this whole, you know, bill, uh, I'm just a bill uh, from Schoolhouse Rock, then we know we also have to pass it in the Senate. And so our energy must be around our two U.S. senators from each state and really asking them to to push towards this legislation in the United States Senate, no matter whether the Democrat or Republican, like we can all push towards police responsibility and accountability, as well as ensuring that, you know, if, if someone gets fired in one district jurisdiction of policing, that they are not hired in another jurisdiction because there should be a national database that tracks these officers. And so that bill would really help us uh, live closer, move closer to this idea of a beloved community and really uh, ensure that George Floyd's legacy moves beyond the verdict on Tuesday, but right. is able to be implemented as a part of the fabric of who we are as a nation moving forward. Absolutely. So what can people take from, you know, this moment in history, you know, because it's pretty rare. I think it's less than 1% or something around the number when police officers are actually convicted. So what can people take uh, from this moment? I think people could take the, that, you know, and I heard this in the jury um, directions, is that what you saw 
is what you experienced and what you felt. And I think for, for far too often, Black people have experienced some things and have, have, have experienced oppression, have experienced racism in this country, and other communities have dismissed it because they, you know, of, of, of how they believe we are overreacting or playing the race card or playing these cards of Trumps that are, are, are going into these tropes without recognizing that this is a systemic problem deep at the core of American policing, deep at the core of American, of America is this idea of racism. Like this nation, when it was birthed and founded, was not founded with me written as a part of the Constitution, was not imagined as me being a human or a full citizen. And so we have to go back through that and really un uncover the reality that what we are talking about is deeply entrenched into the fabric of this country. And we're trying to uproot it from its core and really trying to, you know, really trying to help people frame and understand that 400 years of, of slavery in this country, 400 years of oppression, 400 years of degradation uh, really came to a head when we saw uh, George Floyd uh, being pinned to the ground and Derek Chauvin's knee on his neck. But that was indicative of, you know, every child that goes to school in a school district that doesn't have adequate uh, classroom sizes for all persons to learn. We see that every time that children live in communities without grocery stores. We see it every time that police uh, incarcerate people from for crimes like marijuana while people in other states are literally profiting off of that industry. So we, we've seen this in other fabrics of this country. And I think now is a time to really wrestle with this head on as a systemic problem of racism. And now is the time for us to be anti-racist. Like it's not just enough for us to be non-racist. And too many people have been like non-racist. Well, I'm not racist because it wasn't me, right? But this moment and really that shaped the movement place people wherever you were across the world and you saw that video you responded because you saw uh what what has been taking place and i think that moves us to being anti-racist that that action oriented uh part of this movement which we got to keep as we talked about earlier keeping that same energy like we continually have to show up for people continually have to try to change these laws and continue to have to show compassion and love towards our fellow neighbor absolutely and it's funny you mentioned fellow neighbors because I feel like, you know, there's a lot of issues that happen between the community and law enforcement. So what are some ways people to transform that relationship and help, you know, uh, mend it and, you know, help, you know, the community along with the uh, police enforcement just work together in one, like, as a unison? Sure. I think it's... You know, the idea of policing around public safety is that, you know, communities can keep communities safe. And the idea that they are sworn officers to protect and serve communities that they come from, that they're familiar with, that they are aware of, that they know the actors and the characters in the community. Uh, and that allows us to have a different perspective and a different worldview of how we engage in communities. And so I think that this is a call for more community engagement, like that people should know who's on their block, right? And not just someone calling, coming in from out of communities with guns drawn because they don't know the situations. They don't know the people. They don't know the neighbors. They don't know the grandmother down the street. They don't know the grandchild who, who is struggling with school. And so we have to figure out a way that we can create more community, create more and foster more appreciation of diversity and understanding of who people are and right. take the badge off as not just this symbol of power, but as a symbol of community engagement. And I think that's where, you know, we have to really transform policing in this country through a mindset of public safety of and that's what these calls around defunding the police are about. It's like, how do we defund the mindset of a policing that is around this call of duty mindset. So we grow up like watching cops and robbers. And so there's always this antagonistic, you know, uh, view of police in our communities. And so how do we engage people as like neighbor protectors, right, or like as community defense Defenders or as peacemakers or as peacekeepers and not just as like patrolmen and patrol women who are coming to to hound people and to to try to uphold this idea of power dynamic that has been uh problematic in, in in relations in our communities for so long definitely definitely you know and i feel like it's all about you know knowing the community you serve in, you know and that avoid people coming in just ready to shoot and before they even touch a taser just kind of assess the situation they just really you know, guns blazing, if you know the community you work in, then you'll realize, oh, like, oh, that's Joe from right there. You know, he's just going through it right now. Let me talk. Yeah. We know the people, we've seen them. Like, so we've seen them grow up, you know what I mean? Right. Like, 
uh, we, we've had relationships with them. And, and sometimes like the policing culture is generational. Like someone's, you know, families are a part of the policing culture. And so they've been a part of it. And so you kind of have this generational legacy in communities that we know that there are effective ways to engage in public safety. And there, there are some models that work, you know, and, and what we do in Queens is that we have, you know, some of these alternatives to policing that we're able to call if there's like, you know, mental health crisis or, or if there's, you know, actual like, you know, fights or something happening, we can send, you know, violence interrupters into communities before we get to the challenge of police. Like if y'all are fighting and arguing right now via text message, call a mediator, right? And you can call us and we can kind of help have a conversation and deal with conflict resolution so we don't get to the point where we have to call the police in our communities where we are able to kind of protect our own neighborhoods, protect our own communities, but it comes with people knowing people that we serve absolutely now last question for you because i know you're a busy guy so tell us about the the work you're doing and the support you do at the george floyd uh, memorial foundation well thank you the george floyd memorial foundation it sort of emerged out of this moment as a way to kind of uh shepherd the legacy of george floyd and the family of George Floyd, and, and I'm, and I'm honored to be asked to be on the board to work alongside them as we try to figure out ways to do effective youth education programming, uh, and also teaching people about the principles of kinky and nonviolence as a form of social change. Because if we talk about transforming society and we talk about social change, we must recognize that the, the strongest weapon that we have is the weapon of love and the weapon of nonviolent militant action, which, which is what you know we saw take place all across this country and even throughout the world over this past summer, this freedom summer, if you will. So we're trying to figure out ways in this foundation to, to channel that energy to continue to prepare young people to lead uh, through moral leadership so that they are able to, uh, to, to, to implement the changes that they want to see in this world. And so it was Gandhi that said, be the change you wish to see in the world. And that's one of the phrases that we use uh, to, to honor the legacy of George Floyd is that we want young people to be the change. We want community agents to be the change. We want people who have been silent and on the on the sidelines who have now been moved to action because they saw the video that we once thought was eight minutes and 46 seconds but actually is nine minutes and 29 seconds and move them to action move them to social change so hopefully one day they'll run for office one day they'll be working in the community helping people to register to vote helping people to understand uh, their civic duties and showing up for jury duty and showing up in the civic process uh, and so we're trying to create a culture of civic engagement and create a culture of young people who are committed to doing the work to advance the legacy of George Floyd. And so um, the George Floyd Memorial Foundation, you can search them uh, on Google, find us, um, and really commit to being a part of being a part of this foundation's uh, ambassadors and, and the community of folks who want to be a part of the peacemaking operation that we're trying to do to build beloved community. Sure, man. You know, that's how I finish on JD. I love what you're doing. We're super passionate about, you know, what's going on with this. You know, this kind of stemmed from... Uh, Literally, all like the social unrest last year with community voices, and we're about, I don't know, what, like close to 60 episodes in right now. And each episode make a donation, so we'd love to make a donation to the George Floyd Memorial Foundation of $20,000 to continue work you've been doing. I know it's a small gesture, but you know, Thank it's you. go a long way. I know, I, I believe in you and the vision you have with the foundation and the work you're doing. So, us at JD and Finish Line, I want to thank you and the family as well. Uh, we appreciate that. And we will definitely relay that message to the family and to the board. And just want to thank you for continuing to uplift the voices of community agents and social change agents on the front line. And we will continue to work towards justice. On May 25th, we'll have this Remembrance Day around George Floyd, the day that he was murdered by Derek Chauvin. And we want to use that day to kind of trans change the pain into policy and to use that to, to help push power. And so we're going to ask folks to help call their senators on that day and to really push towards activating uh, our communities towards seeing this legislation pass and seeing it come across the president's desk. Yeah, we need it done ASAP. Yes, sir. We do. It. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, pleasure is mine. Thank you again. Always. Oh.